23rd, 23 years, the 23rd annual Nelson Aldrin birthday party. Praise the Lord. It's been a long time, long time coming. Nelson, of course, was a resident of Wicker Park, and I'm a member of the Nelson Aldrin Committee. Now, you may remember us from the Paris Commune of 1871, when we attempted to hang everyone who made more than $50,000 a year during that unfortunate revolutionary episode. But things have changed, things have been rearranged, and I'd like to kick things off, as folks say, by thanking all of you for coming tonight, for being part of the Nelson Aldrin birthday party. And we know that somewhere up there, Nelson is looking on and thinking, they're still doing it. Amazing. He's up there looking, we hope, tonight. And here to kick things off is Mr. Hugh Iglarsh, another member of the Nelson Aldrin Committee. Please give him a big hand. Yeah, thanks for coming, um, and uh, um, also I wanted to um, do an another, a, a few rounds of uh, additional thank yous. Um, Bill Savage um, for donating copies of um, the book that he edited, his the 60th anniversary edition of Chicago City on the Make, which are for sale in the corner for um, uh, $20 a piece. Um, and um, also, um, there's a, there, there are posters for sale that are new this year uh, that, are, that are actually quite attractive and, and worth taking a look at. And many of our speakers have um, brought, brought books which um, are also worth uh, taking a look at, browsing through, and uh, purchasing. Um, so um, anyway, before we get started, um, again, thanks for coming on this you know, rather damp March night. Um, it's good to see uh, familiar faces as well as new ones. And um, we're here to celebrate, of course, the 103rd birthday of Nelson Algren. Of course, there's an element of nostalgia in all of our annual get-togethers as we enter imaginatively into the life and times of a man who died more than 30 years ago and whose peak creative period uh, was from the mid-30s through, through the early 50s, uh, the age of film noir, of new deals, popular fronts, of anti-fascism and radical populism, an era that in a historical America may as well be the place to see. But we inhabit the present for better or worse, and the real impetus for exploring the past is to get a better grasp on our own time, uh, to see where we came from and where, where, where we seem to be heading. Algren's career and work is a rich background against which the literary and cultural currents of today stand out in relief. Algren's aim as a writer was to speak to and for society, to serve as a, a mirror to the realities that mainstream middle-class consciousness repressed and denied. Thinking about the iconic mid-century photos of Algren taken by Art Shea, Stephen Deitch and others. One is struck by their unselfconsciousness of Algren's utter absorption in his environment, of which he is fully participating in. The sense of oneness with, with <coughs> I'm sorry, the sense of oneness uh, with the gritty setting is what gives them their continuing power. The writer is one with his world. Um, and uh, recently, browsing through the New York Times style section, I, I came across something that's perhaps more representative of the literary world of today, an article called Freshly Pressed, Distinguished Men of Letters and the Standout Shirts of the Season, which has certain very you know, uh, respectable and, and influential writers such as Richard Ford, uh, Martin Amos, and, and uh, Salman Rushdie, you know, wearing these kind of weirdly overpriced shirts. Um, and so there, there are large pictures of the various writers. Here's Salman Rushdie. Which, and the only caption is, Textured Narrative Salvatore Ferragamo Shirt, $430. Um, but the greatest of these writers is Dennis Cooper, who wrote a book called The Marbled Swarm, uh, who is wearing Between the Lines Bottega Veneta Shirt, $820. Um, and it's a very ugly shirt, by the way. Um, but, but anyway, what's, what, what's interesting is that their, their faces, if you can see them at all, they completely dominate the background. This is what I noticed. Um, the, the essence of celebrity culture is that there is no background, there is no environment. There's only this, this aura of, um, really, of, of uh, specialness and stardom. And it's, it's something that, that Nelson Algren, he, this, this wasn't, this wasn't his, his milieu, this wasn't his, his thing. And 
you know, as we get together to, you know, to think about Algren, to talk about Algren, you know, this is one of the reasons why it is important to, to remember him um, and to, to remember, you know, his, his own, uh, he, you know, the, his own career. He was a man with, with quirks. He was a man with his own, his own failings, but he had a very powerful sense of integrity and, and dignity. And it's something that, uh, you know, we, we, we're trying to reclaim tonight. We're trying to create a, a kind of community that's more uh, in line with those, those values. So anyway, the, the first speaker tonight will be, um, will be Lin Din. Um, he, Lin Din was born in Vietnam in 1963, came to the U.S. in 1975, and has also lived in Italy and England. He's the author of two collections of stories, Fake House and Blood and Soap, five books of poems, um, and a novel, Love Like Hate, which came out a couple of years ago. His work has been anthologized in Best American Poetry 2000, 2004, 2007, and Great American Prose Poems from Poe to the Present, among other, many other places. He's also the editor of the anthology um, Night Again, Contemporary Fiction from Vietnam and Three Vietnamese Poets, and translator of Night Fish and Charlie Parker, the poetry of Phan Nien Hao. Um, his poems and stories have been translated into Italian, Spanish, French, Dutch, German, Portuguese, Japanese, Arabic, Icelandic, and Finnish. And he's been invited to read his work in London, Cambridge, Paris, Berlin, Reykjavik, Toronto, and all over the USA. He's also published widely in Vietnamese. His political essays can be seen in Counterpunch, Common Dreams, and Dissident Voice. And he's tracking our deteriorating social scape through his frequently updated photo blog, State of the Union. And uh, he'll be presenting some of his photos right here. Uh, thank you, Hugh. Uh, very glad to be here. Um, for the last three years, I've been involved in this photo and political essay um, blog. We, can we get the pictures? So? Can, can, can you just click, click the mouse? Okay. So, um, yeah, one thing I, uh, so several things I get from Algren is just uh, his endless uh, appetite and stamina for the direct experience, you know. Um, I, I happen to be published by Seven Stories Press, uh, who's, uh, uh, Dan Simon is the behind Seven Stories Press, and um, Seven Stories Press has kept several of Algren's titles in print. Um, so, anyway, um, the first image is uh, of Occupy Philadelphia. Um, the building behind it is the most expensive residence in Philadelphia. The penthouse goes for like a million five hundred thousand dollars, and a studio or apartment goes for five hundred thousand dollars. So I thought it was very interesting that you had this virtual tent city, this um, homeless encampment right outside of, of the most expensive residence in the, in, the, uh, in the city. So, next image, please. That's another image of Philadelphia. Um, my last novel was about the, basically the collapse and the unraveling of Vietnam. So basically my, my current project is about the collapse and unraveling in the United States. You know? So I've been traveling the country to, 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 um, to document what's happening. Next image, please. This guy's Jimbo. Uh, he's from Kensington. Uh, how many of you have heard of the Kenzo mouthwash? No one? It's when they, they uh, force you to bite the curb and step on the back of your head to knock your teeth out. It's called a Kenzo mouthwash. It's Kensington, Philadelphia. But that's when Kensington was still alive and had factories and was still vital. Uh, it's kind of a dead zone now, so. Next image. So he had virtually the same sign, you know, so what's up with that? Like, you got me thinking <laughs> maybe, maybe neither the one has cancer. Um, in Vietnam, the beggars become very enterprising, you know, they come up with all kinds of uh, schemes. And, you know, here too, but uh, one time in Saigon, there was a guy who threatened to, uh, I was eating a bowl of soup on the sidewalk, and this guy grabbed a, um, the bottle of uh, soda from my table and threatened to slam it against his own head unless I gave him some money. So anyway, this man, um, I gave him 12 bucks because he needed to get a new ID. Uh, he wasn't trying to hustle me. He was, he was barely speaking. He was lying in the dark and he was sort of moaning. Um, he looked in, in such bad shape, I had to find out what was happening. So anyway, he got hit by a taxi like a few days earlier. 
And uh, as soon as he was able to walk out of the emergency room, they kicked him out. So, you know, he needed his ID because all his uh, papers were gone in the hospital. Next, please. This is in Detroit. Um, Okay, that, that doesn't need a commentary. <laughs> Next image, please. This is Los Angeles. Next image, please. Uh, this woman was eating out of a trash can in Detroit, and people were laughing at her, so um, I had to wait like a couple blocks later to take her photograph because I didn't want to make more of a spectacle. Just, uh, I couldn't get a straight answer out of her. She couldn't really tell me what was, you know, what was wrong with her and why she got to this position. Next image. Uh, this is Kimberly. Uh, Kimberly used to sell crack. She used to rent out her apartment to prostitutes. Uh, used to be a bar maid. Uh, what struck me about her was how cheerful she was. She said she, she felt sorry for the businessman who walked by her every day because it looked so miserable. Um, oh wait, go go back to Kimberly. Go back, back. Yeah. Um, she she got on a, a Philadelphia uh, bus once and expected to ride for free, and the bus driver asked her for her handicap uh, card because it wasn't obvious to him that she was handicapped, and she thought it was the funniest thing. Anyway, as you can see, you know, her, her, her uh, hands and feet are mo mostly gone. She's off the street, by the way, so, so, you know, she was on the street for like six months, and then she, she apparently she found a more stable living con uh, situation. Next one. I saw a U.S. Marines cap on this guy, and so I started talking to him, and it turned out he was a Vietnam vet. There's a lot of Vietnam vets on the street, of course. So when he found out I was Vietnamese, he said, uh, I'm very proud of you. And I said, well, <laughs> proud of me for what? I didn't do shit, you know, but uh, he had really, uh, really minty breath, like really good breath, you know, like kissable breath. And I was like, what the fuck, you know? So I said, you're drinking mouthwash on you. Yes, of course he was drinking mouthwash, just to get drunk. Next one, please. That's Detroit. When I was in Vietnam, I had a time telling people that there are actually poor Americans here. <laughs> they just couldn't believe it because, you know, we are so good at projecting illusions to the rest of the world, you know? You know uh, the poor the countries, the more seduced they are by what we have here. You know, they think we all, all we do is just rapping and throwing money around and sitting in the jacuzzi. Next, please. You see the SS tattoo? He tried to hide it, you know. Tried to like, see SS. Yeah, so he had the SS tattoo and he was trying to scratch it out. But he had some Chinese character on there too, and I said, um, so I was, I was kind of trying to joke with him a little bit. So I said, what does that say? And he said, I don't know. And I said, he said, I am a faggot. And he, and, and he, but he had a better, he had a good comeback. He said, I don't care what you are. You know, so. <laughs> So, this is in Cleveland. Next one, please. That's in New Orleans. Next one, please. Also New Orleans. It's just tragic what happened to New Orleans, obviously, all the things that happened. You know, now they just uh, tourism and uh, selling sex, I guess. Next, please. Uh, 4 a.m. in New Orleans, Canal and Bourbon Street. I was following her around. Uh, I think there, there might be only one advantage of being an Asian male, is that if you have a camera, they think you're just a stupid Japanese tourist and they just ignore you. <laughs> it's a good thing her pimp didn't show up and chase me away. Uh, this is in New Orleans. He had these, you know, with those shoes like that, I had to talk to him. He said he had a Mexican girlfriend named Chanel, which I, of course is nonsense. I mean, just look at him. Okay, next image, please. I can't remember her name or his name, but this is, uh, she just got new boobs in San Francisco. 
Next one, please. Oops, this is Kimberly. Next one, sorry. Um, but the nose costs more. I didn't know a nose job costs more than a boob job, so. Brand new nose, brand new boobs. Um, in Savannah, I think it's very enterprising how people make a living now. You know, like, th this costs no, um, you know, you just find these reeds and you fold them and you sell them. Next, please. These people were doing the same thing. Uh, she was a prostitute at the uh, Mustang Ranch in Reno, and then she won like 3,000 bucks, and it, she got so excited, she just got all doped up and jumped up a, a bridge over railroad tracks. So anyway, I, I liked them so much, I hung out with them, for, uh, and then I went back to the, um, they had a little trailer that was unheated, uh, no water, no electricity. Next one, please. It was a little crazy because the guy playing the guitar was another Vietnam vet, and uh, I wasn't sure how he would take, you know, how he would deal with me. But anyway, he says it's a cracker party as, as he stopped playing music. So I guess it was an ordinary cracker for the night. It, it was taken with a flash. There was no light in this. It was practically pitch dark in there. Next, please. Okay, talking about living with uh, in a very kind of uh, rudimentary. Uh, Conditions. This is the camps. Uh, this is the tent city in Camden, New Jersey. Um, Camden used to have the biggest shipyard in the world, and uh, Campbell Soup was there. The headquarters still there. The factory is gone. RCA Victor was there. Camden used to be industrial powerhouse. Now it's just a disaster zone. Next one, please. Okay. Now we got to come to the Occupy uh, situation. Uh, I've written quite a bit about it, uh, praising it and criticizing it. This was the first week in New York City. Next, please. This is about uh, a month and a half into the Occupy uh, in New York City. Next, please. This is in Philadelphia. I think um, the, the original premise of disrupting the system was a brilliant idea and they need to return to that. They need to disrupt the system. Uh, to occupy parks, just not going to do it, okay? So, you know, you got to focus on your targets and, 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 and mess with them, you know? So next one, please. Okay, that's the last image, uh, Occupy Philadelphia. Thank you very much. Thank you. That, that was uh, a, a very, uh, very compelling, very moving um, uh, set of images there. And it would be interesting to, if, uh, you know, to see that published at some point. Um, our, our, the next performer is uh, folk singer Bucky Hawker. Uh, he's a singer, songwriter, performer, and historian with a dozen recordings to his credit, including the All Originals Wisconsin 2 1363, Welcome to Labor, and his renderings of Illinois, folk, uh, Illinois labor songs. Bucky, a PhD in history, is the author of For Democracy, Workers, and God, Labor Song Poems and Labor Protest, 1865-1895, and produced the acclaimed four-CD set, Folk Songs of Illinois. He also serves on the board of the Woody Guthrie Foundation and Archives. He's currently the Archie Green Fellow with the Library of Congress American Folk Life Center. Please give a, 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 a warm welcome to Bucky Hawkins. Thank you. This thing will work over here. Check one, two. It's almost as if I should just stand out there and scat, isn't it? <laughs> well, this is the hundredth anniversary this year of Woody Guthrie's birth. So I feel I, uh, I gotta do one Woody Guthrie song here. And it's actually one of Woody's first efforts at political songwriting, something he wrote in 1938. He was uh, still living in California. It's called I Ain't Got No Home. I ain't got no home, I'm just rambling around. I'm a hard working man. I go from town to town, you know that the police make it hard. Got no home in this world anymore. My brothers and my 
my sisters, they came walking down this road. It's a hot and dusty road, that million feet I trod. Then the rich man took my house and he chased me from my door. I ain't got no home in this world anymore. I ain't got no home at this rambling house. I'm a hard working man. Go from town to town, you know that the police make it hard. Wherever I may go, I ain't got no home. I was poor, my crops I would pay Right at the banker's door Then my wife took down and died Upon our cabin floor I ain't got no home in this world anymore I ain't got no home, I just wandered around I'm a hard working man Go from town to town, you know that the police may be hard Just to see what I can see It's a wide, wicked world It's such a funny place to be you Know that the gambling men get rich While the working folks stay poor I ain't got no home in this world anymore I ain't got no home, I just family I'm a hard working man Go from town to town You know that the police make it hard I hope this next one comes off. Actually, we got another centennial coming up, uh, not just Studs Turco, which is this year. And I guess I should say uh, May 16th at the Newberry, right, Paul? Uh, we're doing a, a, a tribute to uh, Studs there. I want to encourage you to come. And also May 19th at Metro, a uh, tribute to Woody Guthrie with Klezmatics, uh, Holly Near, myself, John Langford, uh, who else? Tom Morello, a couple other performers. And then again, also on the 30th of June at the Old Town with a bunch of local performers will be doing a tribute to Woody Guthrie as well. But 2015 is coming up fast, and we know how presses and record companies are. They're always three years behind getting stuff out. So <laughs> I wanted to do a Joe Hill song tonight because we're coming up on the, in 2015, the 100th anniversary of Joe Hill's execution in beautiful Salt Lake. And since we've got Mitt Romney running for president, I just always feel at some point I have to bite my tongue about the LDS. <laughs> i just say, um, yes, anybody who's ever lived in Salt Lake or close to it would know that you would probably be shot too if you lived there right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, I guess most of this audience would be put in jail in Salt Lake today. <laughs> so let me play a little song. It was popular here, so popular that Carl Sandburg uh, collected this. I found it down in Galesburg when he was a young guy just trying to collect music from around the United States. But this is one that railroad workers sang here in Illinois, one of Joe Hill's songs called Casey Jones, The Union Scab. You know the work is on the SP line to strike sent out a call. But Casey Jones, the engineer, he wouldn't strike at all. His boiler, it was leaking. His driver's on the bump. And his engine and his parents, they were all out of fun. 
Casey Jones, he kept his junk pile running. Casey Jones, he was doing mighty fine. Casey Jones got himself a wooden medal for being good and faithful on the SP line. You know the workers said to Casey, won't you help us win this strike? But Casey Jones said, let me alone, you ought to take a hike. And Casey's wheezy engine ran right off the worn out track. And Casey hit the river with an awful crack. Casey Jones, he went down flying. Casey Jones went and broke his human spine. Well, Casey Jones became an Angelino. He took a trip to heaven on the SP line. You know that Casey got to heaven right up to the pearly gates. He said, I'm Casey Jones, don't you know I pull the SP free? Well, you're just a man, said Peter. Our musicians are on strike. You'll get a job of scabbing any time you Casey Jones got a job in heaven. Casey Jones was doing mighty fine. Well, Casey Jones went stabbing on the angels just like he did the workers on the SB line. said to Peter, you know this isn't fair. Well, Casey Jones, they go around stabbing everywhere. Well, the Angels Union 23, they sure were there. And they probably fired Casey down that golden stair. Casey Jones, he went to hell a flying. Casey Jones, the devil said, oh, fine. Well, Casey Jones, get busy shoveling sulfur. That's what you get for scabbing on the SP line. It's what you get for scabbing on the SP line. It's what you get for scabbing on the SP line. wanted to do one uh, song that uh, a songwriter here from Chicago wrote. Uh, this is actually um, from the Eisenhower era. Uh, in the 1950s, of course, Eisenhower was president for a good period uh, after Truman. And uh, Joe McCarthy was, of course, running roughshod in the United States. I think it says just how crazy things got um, that a guy who wrote a song in Chicago that all it does is really just has a, a refrain about, I got the Eisenhower blues, uh, was investigated by the FBI. He got himself an FBI file. Strange thing about the guy who wrote this, J.B. Lenoir, was something of a minor R&B hit, but I guess, or a blues hit on the, the blues charts, but mostly I would say J.B. Lenoir never really enjoyed a whole lot of fame or fortune and ended up dying in his late 1930s uh, in uh, Urbana. Now, I just did a show down there earlier this year, uh, and they told me that, and I don't know if it's true, it sounds like one of those, uh, those myths, but could well be true, that the reason J.B. Lenoir died, um, he had a heart attack, he was only, I think, 38, uh, was that uh, he couldn't get hospital treatment, which wouldn't surprise me. Um, but he wrote this great tune I like to play, a little up-tempo ditty, as I say, called the Eisenhower Blues. And I want to thank uh, Hugh for asking me to play today. It's really fun to get up here. It's a great little venue to come down to once in a while. And enjoy the rest of the night, too. Hey, everybody, talking to you. I get job, and that's a natural truth. And I says, you now, baby, I got the eyes and how it I'm talking about 
about you and me now, baby. Yeah, yeah. What on earth we gonna do? My wallet's empty. My fun is gone. The way things go, and I won't be here long. And I says, Good night, baby. I got the eyes and I will be. My money just to pay the tax I'm giving you people all the natural facts I'm telling you people now it's my belief The way things go and I'll be on the leave And I say, who now baby? I got the eyes and how it views I'm talking about you and me now baby Dollar girl, I ain't got a cent. I ain't got the money now to pay the rent. My baby needs her clothes, she needs her shoes. People tell me now, what am I to do? And I said, Who now, baby? I got the eyes and how I blue. I'm talking about you and me now, baby. I'm talking about you and me now, baby. Yeah, yeah. What on earth are we gonna do? I'm talking about you and me now, baby. Yeah, yeah. What on earth are we gonna do? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Bucky Hawker. That was that was terrific. I, I particularly like the, the Joe Hill song, um, the uh, the Casey Jones Union Scab. Um, I would like to remind everyone that although we are in a church, drinking is allowed and indeed encouraged. And um, you can get your, your drink tickets by by the entrance, and um, uh, wine and beer and, and soft drinks are available over there. Uh, and uh, Kurt will be glad to serve you. Um, our next speaker is is uh, Bruce Levine. Uh, who is a dissident clinical psychologist in Cincinnati, Ohio, who writes and speaks widely on how society, culture, politics, and psychology intersect. His latest book, which is for sale uh, in, in the corner near the entrance, is Get Up, Stand Up, Uniting Populists, Energizing the Defeated, and Battling the Corporate Elite. Earlier books include Surviving America's Depression Epidemic, How to Find Morale, Energy, and Community in a World Gone Crazy, and Common Sense Rebellion, which is a good Algren title, taking back your life from drugs, shrinks, corporations, and a world gone crazy. He's a regular contributor to Counterpunch, Alternet, Truthout, and Z Magazine, and his blog for the Huffington Post. His articles and interviews have been uh, published in Adbusters, The Ecologist, High Times, and numerous other magazines. And here is Bruce Levine. I'm going to try it without the microphone. Can people hear me? Yes. Okay. 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 I, I thought so. I speak pretty loud. Um, as, as many of you know here, Nelson Algren, he belongs to this select group, select group of great American writers and other artists who really help rehumanize people out there in our society who've been dehumanized, who've been marginalized. And in this select group of people, um, these, these, a lot of these folks, they had these, they, they weren't, they were unafraid of being politically incorrect. I mean, they didn't really give a damn about it, people like Nelson Algren, and they had these biting 
wits, these great sense of humor, and all of this helped marginalize, marginalize them. And ultimately, a lot of these folks in this select group felt really unappreciated. And they stopped caring themselves, sadly. And some of these folks, they stopped caring about their art. And some of these folks even stopped caring about their very lives, OK? And um, one of the things I've learned about Nelson Algren over the last few months was that he became despondent himself on several occasions in his life. And according to the uh, one biography about him, the Tina Drew biography, that at one point after his first novel sold only 762 copies in one year, he made a suicide attempt and ended up in a mental hospital. And you know, one of the things you know, that I, I talk about with young people today is that you're living in a success-oriented society, but there's a lot of things that you want to be a failure at, really. And one of them, for sure, is a suicide attempt after your first novel only sells 762 copies. <laughs> I, authors remember that number, 762 copies. It makes you feel better when you're an author to know that Nelson Algren. And thankfully, he, it was a failed attempt for Nelson Olga because all his great things comes afterwards. All his great work comes after that attempt. But uh, sadly, some folks in this select group, uh, my select group, they were successful in their suicide attempts, feeling, again, unappreciated, uncared about. And a guy I've been thinking about a lot lately, maybe some of you know him, is Phil Oakes. Yeah. Um, I see some head shakes. And he, he got me through my teenage years. I mean, he was a guy, one guy that I could resonate with as a teenager, a guy who not only trashed the crazy right-wingers in society, but also made fun of the phony liberals. And, and this was a, a guy who got me through my teenage years. And sadly, in 1976, at age 35 years old, feeling unappreciated, he uh, made a successful suicide attempt. And, and I've been thinking a lot about Oaks lately, especially since I knew I was coming here, too, because the interesting thing was that and some of you might have noticed last year, after many, many years in the making, a documentary on his life, I see some hit shakes, finally came out. A lot, it took a long time, but it, it got into a lot of movie theaters. And that was also really shocking, a documentary. And then this year, I don't know if you saw it, but on PBS, on American Masters, they ran this documentary. And I was just, I was just overwhelmed. And I, all I could think about was that, you know, if you're one of these folks in the select group that is this real truth teller that makes America really feel uncomfortable, um, you, you're going to be uncared about in your lifetime. It's going to happen a lot. But if you're dead long enough, okay, and that, that's the key phrase, if you're dead long enough, um, America starts to like you again. And, you know, Nelson Aldman died in 1981. Phil Oaks died in 1976, so for sure in five years you're going to see Algren everywhere, at least in this Phil Oaks formula. Another uh, thing I've learned a lot about uh, Nelson Algren was that he had a lot of contempt for my profession, the mental health profession. And from where I'm sitting, you cannot have too much contempt for the mental health profession. <laughs> uh, for a guy like Algren, there were a lot of reasons why he had contempt, but I'll just give you one. I mean, if, if you've read 100 pages of a Nelson Algren novel or his hero Dostoevsky, you know more about real human psychology, what drives people into self-destructive behaviors, um, the really importance of human relationships. You know more than if you spent the decade of your life getting a BA in psychology, a master's in psychology, a PhD, postdoctoral, postdoctoral work. And I can tell you that because I've done all of this, okay? And, you know, I think, though, today, if Nelson Algren were around, he not only would have, he would go beyond contempt for my profession, he would move into outright laughter. Because why? Because my profession is turned into one of his favorite words, a racket. I mean, Nelson Algren, he loved to use that word, a racket. And what happened in my profession 20, 25 years ago was that pharmaceutical companies just basically annexed the whole profession. Okay, I mean, just about every significant major mental health institution from the American Psychiatric Association to every one of them takes millions of dollars from drug companies. Okay, and, and that's, you know, and the American Psychiatric Association publishes the Diagnostic Bible, something called the DSM. And what they've been doing is just figuring out a way to make every kind of human behavior out there that creates any kind of tension for authorities, any authorities, to pathologize that and drug that. And so, when I was in graduate school, I saw this coming. They, they decided to, for stubborn kids, any kid who had symptoms of refusing to comply with adults' requests or rules got diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder. 
Literally, I'm not making this up. This is sar sarcastic. And these kids, you know, got more and more drug. And then when they got away with this, they realized, well, you know, there's a lot of parents in America, but they all want their kids to be extroverted. They want them to all be leaders. So let's take, if you have a shy kid, we'll convince parents that they have social anxiety disorder, and we'll drug them too. And so it went on and on and on. And so, you know, what happened to a guy like me is, is that I became sort of very embarrassed by my profession. And I, I wonder, I wonder why my, you know, fellow, there's only a handful of other, like, dissident mental health professionals. And I've been thinking about this, and the only thing I could sort of think about is that a lot of my profession, which has turned into an industry, has really, you know, sort of followed the um, sort of advice, the therapy of, of Nifty Louie. And uh, for some of you who've read Nelson Aldrin's The Man of the Golden Arm, Nifty Louie was the uh, drug pusher who ultimately um, Frankie Machine killed. And, but Nifty Louie, his, his line in, in the book, which just hit home for me, was he said, he said, a man who is ashamed of his racket is ashamed of his mother. <laughs> and, and I could just see the president of the American Psychiatric Association, Nifty Louie and, I don't know, Rod Blagojevich, you know, going, a man who's ashamed of his racket is ashamed of his mother, you know? So, but this is, you know, what, what, so what's happened to me over the last, oh, 15 years is I've spent a lot of time writing articles, sort of trying to expose this kind of, what's happened in my, sort of what's now become a psychiatric pharmaceutical industrial complex. And, you know, a, a few years back, I decided I wanted to write this book about, to help kind of depress anti-authoritarians who have, like, not, you know, bought into the psychiatric pharmaceutical industrial complex. People like Nelson Aldrin, Phil Oakes, these kinds of folks. And so that's that book, Surviving America's Depression Epidemic. That, I came out with that. And then a few years ago, I started to see like all of America seemed to be kind of catching up to that place of cynicism and skepticism and hopelessness that people like Phil Oakes and Nelson Aldrin came to. And, and I started to, you know, on a political level, not only we were all kind of moving into depression, but a kind of political apathy. And, you know, they were, I mean, I, I was looking at, you know, the majority of Americans were opposing these senseless wars and these corporate bailouts, but there was very little resistance, okay? And so what I decided to do was, like, was right, you know, get into this thing and, and, and figure out what were the spokes in the wheel, besides my own mental health profession, that were helping <laughs> subdue people, and what the heck, if anything, we could do to kind of transform that, give people their energy to do battle back again. So I want to just finish up with some of the kind of interesting things that happened with that book that I thought some of you might be interested. I, I learned that this celebration, this year's celebration, is dedicated to the Occupy movement. And so some things happened that were sort of interesting with this Get Up, Stand Up, and the Occupy movement. And one was that by luck or whatever, it came out in spring of 2011. And then I, I found out that some of the Occupy organizers got a hold of it, especially the guys, some of the ones I, I, I got to know in the Occupy DC. It was originally called something else, but it, it soon became Occupy DC. And they were using it. And that was a really great feeling, OK? And then what happened was, in, when after Occupy Wall Street came out in, in the fall of last year, my publisher um, decided they were going to donate 100 copies to the Occupy Wall Street Library. And that was a really good feeling, because it was really getting in the hands of people exactly who I wanted to have it. And then, in November okay, of last year, I get this email from assistant at my publisher saying, you've got to see this clip from Democracy Now! And people know Democracy Now!, Amy Goodman, so I see some head shakes. And anyway, so I, I looked at this clip, and what the clip was, was the New York City Police Department going into Zuccotti Park and confiscating everything there. This, and this, this clip was uh, November 28, 2011. And they, were, they, comp they went into the Occupy Wall Street Library and they started to throw everything in there into dumpsters, you know? I don't know what to incinerate them. I don't know what they're going to do, but they're just getting rid of everything. And I'm watching this clip, and then all of a sudden they, I see uh, they focus in for long shots, long shots for, uh, for two books. One book was the Bible. And then the other book was Get Up, Stand Up. And I, I, gotta tell, I don't know how to describe that feeling. <laughs> it wasn't a totally bad feeling, I must say, <laughs> but it was a weird feeling. But anyways, what happened was, and I just finished with this, is that a, 
a week after I did that, uh, that, that happened, I'm on the, I did a lot of radio interviews for this book, and, and one a guy, this New York City uh, comedian, this guy named Lee Camp, sort of a kind of George Carlin, young George Carlin kind of guy, and he's doing this podcast, and he's talking to his audience, and he's saying, you know, we're talking about this event that happened in Zuccotti Park, where, <laughs> and, he, and, he said, and he says to his audience, you know, I don't know, you know, you may be not so sure about the Occupy movement, but you got to know, you got to know you're on the right side when the other side is burning books. <laughs> and I also want to add, I want to add here, just finish with this, is that I know I'm on the right side when I'm on the side of the dehumanized and the marginalized and the oppressed people. And I also know that I'm on the right side when I'm hanging out, as I am here tonight, with people who are celebrating the champions of the marginalized, especially when they're champions like Nelson Algren, who themselves got marginalized. <laughs> so happy birthday, Nelson Algren. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody. You, you like music, don't you? you? like a little music. We got a little music in order. Now, you know from the Bible that if you follow the ways of the Lord, you get to sit at the right hand of God. We know that from Scripture. Don't we know that from Scripture? Of course we know that from Scripture. Amen, brother. What else do we know from Scripture? We know that the Lord loves music. David, the king of all of Israel, was a man known for his ability to play, sing, dance, and sashay. And that's why the gentleman who's coming up right now is going to sit someday at the left hand of God. And the reason he's going to sit at the left hand of God is because he has God's left hand. I bring you, ladies and gentlemen, tonight on behalf of the Aldrin Committee, the indubitable, the amazing, the, 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 the spodacious. Keep on going. Brother Irwin Helfer, the greatest of the boogie piano players. Let's hear it.
a tune called After Hours, was popular back in 1939 by the pianist Avery Parrish. And it used to be called the Black National Anthem. When I played in the Cornell Lounge on the South Side, people would come in and say, play the National Anthem, and this is what they wanted to hear, After Hours.
Is uh, Ron Seymour out there in the, in the audience somewhere? Ron Seymour, you here? Ron, Ron, where are you? Okay, good, here. Um, there, there are a couple of uh, photographers who are associated with Nelson Alder, Art Shea being one, of course, and uh, the other one being Steve Seven Deutsch. And uh, <laughs> when you get a chance during the, the very brief pause we're going to do, I urge you to come up and take a look at Ron Seymour's photos up here, which, are, which put him in, the, in, the, uh, in that uh, pantheon of photographers who did so well by Algren and, and uh, who deserve to be, whose work deserves to be seen and published. And, and lionized. Anyway, Ron is here with us fortunately tonight. He's been living in Wicker Park for a long, long time. And uh, he knew Nelson Aldrin and was able to take these wonderful pictures which I urge you to see. And he's going to come up and say a few words about his uh, uh, meeting Aldrin on occasion and uh, attendant uh, stuff. So Ron Seymour. I didn't really know Nelson that well. I spent a day and a half with him. Uh, I was actually on an assignment for Playboy magazine, and he had written a short story for Playboy, and they hired me to photograph Nelson. Uh, so I contacted him, went over to his house one morning, and we spent the day in, his, in hanging out. Uh, in the morning, first we just talked uh, before I took any photographs because I read Nelson and you know, loved his work and uh, did a few photographs around the house and then he said, come on, we've got to go over to the bathhouse because his shower was broken and it had been broken for about two years <laughs> and he never had it fixed but he went to the bathhouse every day, every morning about 11 o'clock he'd go to the bathhouse. And so I went over there with him and we... Pardon? Pull the mic down. Lower? Yeah. Okay. That better? Yeah. Okay. Well, I could grow, but I can't. Uh, and uh, so we took a schwitz together in the bathhouse. It was a great bathhouse, the Luxor Baths. Uh, a wonderful place. And then we ate lunch in their lunchroom. They had a great little lunchroom. You took your steam bath and then if you wanted you could dive into their ice cold pool. Uh, then they had crisp clean sheets that you'd wrap yourself with and then you'd go in their lunchroom and bottles of soda and whatever and they made skirt steaks. It was great, great place. Uh, so we did that, and then we walked around the neighborhood, and this photograph over here, now is on the North Avenue, just a little bit east of, east of here, uh, there was that boarded up window, and that's how he communicated with people. He would leave a note on that boarded up window, stick a note in to somebody and somebody, that person would in turn, you know, leave a reply on there and they go back and forth that way. So that was his messaging board over there and, and over. it was great. Uh, anyways, it, it was an honor to be with him and, and get to know him and talk to him and uh, it was fun and he was a great guy. That's about it. <laughs> I have, you know, still have all my negatives of Nelson and the photographs. My studio is right around the corner, actually, on Milwaukee, right next to the Red Hen Bakery. Uh, so you guys are welcome to come over anytime and stop by. It's 1625 Milwaukee. Uh, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you.